Good morning to all of you. In spite of this uh, heavy rain and cloudy morning, uh, at least few of you have joined online and others will be joining, I hope. Uh, just to recapitulate what we have discussed in the last class with respect to the uh, Darwin Valley's concept. So, Darwin Valley's concept has such a uh, postulation. One is the overproduction, which we have already discussed about that. All organisms tend to produce more and more offspring. When they produce more and more offspring, that results in the competition. Competition for the basic requirements and the natural resources. It may be for the space or it may be for the mate or it may be for the food. Then uh, in this, all the offsprings that are produced, all of them are not identical, but they will show lot of variation with respect to their uh, physical appearance as well as anatomy, physiology. In one word, if I want to put, they will exhibit also genetic variation. So this uh, genetic variation out of this one, the nature will select the best variation which is more suited or more adapted to the nature. So this leads to what you know, this is known as natural selection. The selection by the nature, the selection selects the, the nature selects the fittest one, that is what you call natural selection and this natural selection ultimately leads to what is known as speciation or the formation of a new species or speciation. These are the highlights of the Darwin Valley's concept which is also popularly known as uh, theory of natural selection. Now, the very important thing is when Darwin proposed, Darwin and Wallace proposed this theory of natural selection, they were blissfully ignorant of genetics and the modern molecular biology. This we have to keep in mind. So, without having the knowledge of the genetics and molecular biology, the Darwin and Wallace mainly based on the morphological appearance of the species and studying the uh, different types of at the different examples at Galapagos Island or uh, in the uh, uh, valleys by uh, near Australia and other places, they propose this theory of natural selection. So, uh, but the today when we stand in this 21st century and look back to what the Darwin has valleys has proposed, we may find lot of loopholes. We may find lot of uh, things which are not properly explained. Uh, the one of the major uh, problem Darwin's theory uh, is fails to explain the mechanism of natural selection. How actually the natural selection happens? This is uh, we cannot blame Darwin and Wallace at that time because, as I have told you, the they were not knowing about the the genetics even they failed to uh, explain us how the variations transmitted from person from one generation to another generation or parents to offspring. So that's why now after studying this Darwin Valley's concept or theory of natural selection, uh, what can what we should do is uh, we should know where Darwin went wrong or uh, it's also more uh, precise terminology would be the criticism for Darwin Valley's concept. So this uh, criticism is based on the modern knowledge that we have. Even after the Darwin and Valley's published their theory of natural selection, there, at that time also there were certain criticism because the sum of the facts which where the Darwin was criticized or where Darwin went wrong in explaining uh, the theory of evolution is the survival of the fittest. So, Darwin satisfactorily explained the survival of the fittest. 
but he never mentioned the arrival of the witness how this witness character arrives what is the criteria uh, for a fittest character and all of you know that the fitness of an organism need not be uh, always fittest character but when the nature changes the character which is once considered the most fittest character may become obsolete so that's why he failed to explain the arrival of the fittest uh, then uh, because we know that today there are lot of things we have uh, we have seen mimicry development of electrical organs uh, which are uh, advantage certainly the advantages character or adaptive character for any given species but uh, uh, the problem is how this must have appeared all those things uh, undoubtedly the evolution is towards perfection um but how these perfections or the fitness arrives he failed to explain this is one of the major criticism for darwin second one is sometimes the over specialization of the some of like the tusks of the elephant in case of the male in the case of asiatic elephants or in africa both male and female they have a long tusk even the uh the deer have large antlers uh, we have seen that especially the antlers of the deer uh, instead of providing usefulness many times it is a hindrance for them while running while escaping themselves from the uh, predators and all it is very difficult because on the head there is a long antler antler andre you know kannadalli kodu ante vela there's also branched horns uh, in many of them and uh, that will affect the survival of the organism actually the specialization should prove to uh, make the organism more fittest uh, but unfortunately the long tusk of the elephant sometimes and uh, the antlers especially in the male deer um, instead of providing any useful or adaptive character to them uh, they have become hindrance to them uh, so that's why how the darwin explain this one uh there are many body structure uh, which uh, evolves and which are been selected by the nature should now have reached the harmful stage if natural selection was operating somewhere at uh, when the horn may be useful for fighting and other thing to a certain extent but overgrown uh, well branch uh, it will have so many other complication so that's why if natural selection is the only force which Uh, decides this evolution and it has the capacity to select then somewhere in the mid uh, when a medium sized horn the soy horns become or antlers become medium sized then it should stop somewhere uh, the nature selection uh, natural selection should not select those uh, deer which are having very long very big antlers branched antlers so this is another problem if you say that it is the over specialization sometimes uh, instead of providing more and more fitness to the organism has become a hindrance uh, uh, but even darwin has tried to this one over specialization by darwin on the basis of discontinuous variation of spores all of it and they appear because he the he was not knowing about mutation and other things and he said that these antlers are there uh, sometime they get uh, over specialized some of the organs but they do not play any role in evolution that's what he has given but still then uh, this is the this remains as a big question why natural selection um, select those things which over specialized organs which are of no use and not only no use many times they are hindrance to the organism then uh, a uh, natural selection also fails to explain uh, many times the degeneration of many useful uh, structures uh, even there are organisms which are having some useful structures in course of time uh, it has seen that they have lost that useful structure though even in the given scenario on the present scenario it is the best adaptive character to the nature the so disappears to the state of Uh, to the state the effect 
and not the cause. So this is the very important uh, uh, objection against this natural selection. If natural selection um, is uh, absolutely the force uh, responsible for natural uh, evolution, then uh, and if it is going to select only the fittest characters, then why so many uh, uh, organs have become uh, uh, degenerated in spite of their being useful? Then uh, One classical objection to the natural selection, uh, whatever the new variations developed by the organism may be lost by dilution. What do you mean by dilution? An individual possessing a uh, new variation, if it is bred with the other without that new variation, uh, then what might happen is, the chances of inheriting this new variation to the uh, future generation may be diluted because uh, there are more number of uh, individuals which are not having this character and when they bred with the one which is having the new character, uh, this may get diluted. Uh, so this is what the criticism, but uh, remember at that time, and, uh, we now know that uh, uh, the, about the genes and genetics, but at that time the people were not knowing. So they thought that if uh, <coughs> a new character may appear, but when they bred with the one which is not having that character, who are more in number, then naturally this new character may get diluted. Uh, then the another important is that Darwin was influenced by Lama. So that's why it's not wrong to say if I, if I know if it is not wrong if I say uh, Lamarckian idea of inheritance of acquired character uh, Darwin also accepted indirectly uh, inheritance of acquired character in the form of pangenesis hypothesis uh, inheritance of the acquired characters so this was not uh, acceptable in the present scenario but Darwin uh, when he said survival of the fittest or arrival of the new character, it was mostly the in, inherited characters, uh, so the characters, uh, acquired characters and uh, he was not knowing how it is going to inherit in the future. So that's why after, uh, because of all this criticism, uh, there were other scientists who want to support Darwin. Uh, to support Darwin, what they did, they started a new school that is known as New Neo Darwinism. That is, uh, this school of scientists put new ideas to the Darwin. They never disapproved Darwinism, but what they did was they tried to advocate for Darwin, Darwinism or Darwin Dallas concept with the input of the new ideas. Especially new Darwinians are T. H. Huxley. T. H. Huxley is popularly known as Bulldog of Darwin. Then Herbert Spencer, Jordan, Asa Gray, Haeckel, Weissman, uh, most of them are geneticists. Uh, they believe uh, natural selection has accounted everything that involved in evolution. They try to uh, support Darwin saying that uh, natural selection has accounted for everything that is involved in evolution, even in genetics, even in molecular biology, even in any field, uh, the new day suggested that natural selection is always there and it is the entire evolution is because of the natural selection. So that uh, school of scientists, it is known as neo-Darwinism and later it gave rise to another theory what we call synthetic theory of evolution. So, uh, even uh, some of the neo Darwinians, such as Weissman and his follower, uh, rejected some of the theories of Darwin, accepted the others. Uh, so, Weissman and uh, his followers accepted its principal element natural selection. 
but uh, they never approved the very survival of the fittest or struggle and all those things. So uh, they distinguish uh, because at that time new Darwinians were having the idea of genetics. So they can distinguish between germplasm, that's a slight uh, typographical error. It is between germplasm and somatoplasm of the living organism in their germplasm theory. Now we know that only the germplasm is going to contribute uh, the characters in the offsprings, not the somatoplasm. Germplasm and somatoplasm are uh, soma this uh, cro among the chromosomes, we know somatic chromosomes and sex chromosomes. Sex chromosomes are going to take part in the characteristic, in developing the characteristic feature, not the uh, uh, somatic uh, cells or oh, sorry, even the cells, uh, somatic cells and uh, germ cells. Germ cells are going to take part or going to contribute for the future generation, not the somatic cells or the body cells. So that's why they agreed to the fact of natural selection, but disapproved other things. And uh, even neo Darwinians uh, thought that whatever the adaptations an organism develops is the result of multiple force. And natural selection is one such force. They never denied the uh, role of natural selection in speciation, but they suggested that uh, it's fine that uh, any organism which get adapts to the nature, they are selected by the nature, but uh, what they suggested was adaptation uh, to the nature is the result of multiple forces. Natural selection may be one such force. Uh, believe that the characters are not inherited as such. Uh, because uh, you know that to inherit a character in the offspring, there will be contribution from two individuals, that is the, from two maternal side as well as the paternal side, they equally contribute to the offspring. So that's why uh, they suggested that, okay, there may be a force, there is a force natural selection uh, which operates continuously and helps in evolution. But it is not, own, not the only force that determines the evolution. There are so many other factors. That's what this neuro Darwinians uh, suggested. Um, even the ultimate character would result out due to the interaction of determinants, activity of the organism and environment during the development. Okay, they have also put one more thing, the role of environment, uh, role of environment and uh, interactions and activity of the organism, all these factors also influence on the uh, evolution of an organism. So, even uh, neo-Darwinism was incomplete and partly wrong. Uh, even neo-Darwinians also, they know, they were knowing little bit about this genetics, but uh, genetics was not fully understood at that time. So, that's why even neo-Darwinism is also not a complete theory. But uh, this uh, gave rise to uh, a very another very important uh, this thing what you call the synthetic theory of evolution. So that's why uh, you can see the evolution of the theories also. Earlier it started with abiogenesis, then the spontaneous generation, then biogenesis, then Lamarckian theory, followed by that Darwin Wallace concept, then the new uh, Darwinism, all these peers are showing the evolution uh, in explaining uh, the process of uh, uh, evolution and ultimately the speciation. So, uh, this is about the theories which are regarding the uh, evolutionary theory and that is one more theory that the synthetic theory of evolution uh, where which we will take up later. Uh, before that, we have something to discuss also in between. Uh, because this synthetic theory of evolution, which is actually uh, developed by taking uh, the inputs and insight from different branches of science. And uh, it is a more holistic theory compared to either natural uh, this darwin wallace concept or even the neo uh, About that, we will discuss that in the uh, next class. Uh, but now, uh, 
uh, uh, what I feel is uh, we should uh, go to the another uh, small topic uh, which also justifies uh, the evolution. Because many times we say evolution is taking place, evolution has taken place, um, less advanced organism gave rise to this present day, uh, more advanced organisms, simpler organisms uh, evolved into more and more complex organisms. All those things is fine to hear. But if uh, if if you ask, is there any evidence for this evolution? There's the more thing because being the student of science, uh, we cannot you cannot simply uh, rely upon what I say or what the book says or somebody says. Uh, you should be convinced with the evidences. Uh, so uh, that's why in this small chapter, we let's try to find out uh, or the evidences for this evolution. Is there any evidence for evolution? How we can say that? How we can justify the evolution has taken place uh, since the inception or beginning of the earth or beginning of life to present day uh, complex form. So for this, uh, we will try to find out some evidences uh, one by one. Uh, that is uh, evidences uh, in support of this evolution. So evidences in support of uh, evolution comes from various branches, uh, even from taxonomy, even in embryology, even if you see the comparative anatomy, even due geography or due uh, or biogeography, the distribution of animals and plants on the world, then fossil records, biochemistry, molecular biology, all those things. Uh, give us uh, some input with reference to the evidences in, which are in support of evolution. So here uh, we will try to understand these evidences one by one. So biological evidences, if we say, which are in support of uh, evolution, uh, before understanding the evidences, we should agree to the fact one thing, all existing organism descended with modification. That means all existing organisms are more complex and we have descended from a very simpler organism and over a long period of time we have achieved or we have attained to this uh, complexity. Uh, all form, life forms should have fundamental similarities. When we have evolved from simpler to complex at the subtle level uh, all living forms should have some fundamental similarities yes of course any living being you take they are mainly consists of carbon nitrogen hydrogen oxygen because we are all organic forms organisms naturally irrespective of the type of the animal or plant our body is made up of carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen and oxygen. And the chromosomes of all living beings consist DNA, that is the deoxyribonucleic acid. Third fundamental similarity is all cells synthesize the proteins. Protein synthesis is the major function of all cells. See, these are the similarities, fundamental similarities, irrespective of whether an organism is primitive or advanced or simpler or complex, that is the second, secondary thing. But if you look into the fundamentals, uh, these similarities are uh, very well seen. Like all organisms uh, consists of mainly carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen and oxygen and any chromosome, either any plant or animal you take, it is made out, it consists of DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, and all cells, starting from protozoa to mammals, uh, the all cells synthesize of the protein. So these are some of the fundamental similarities. Uh, by this, one thing is uh, uh, what we can, draw, the, the inference that, that we can draw out of it is, uh, all organisms, basically, they are fundamentally same. The complexity is the later 
uh, addition to that. So here, by seeing that, what we should uh, find out is, is there any evolutionary relationships among the living beings? Biochemistry, for this biochemistry you provide the evidences to find out the evolutionary relationship between the organism. For example, if you take blood proteins are similar among all mammals. Either you take the blood protein of a human being or a rat or a cat, uh, blood proteins are similar. What does it indicate? Uh, it indicates that we have, we have some, some level of relationship with those organs. Even if you take the blood chemistry, even among mammals, uh, is related more closely to the great apes than to old world monkeys, then to new world monkeys, then lower primates such as lambios. We have very close blood chemistry with greater apes like chimpanzees and uh, orangutan and all. But, and we have slightly less similarity with the old world monkeys. What is old world monkeys? The monkeys which are found in Asia and Africa. Even less similarity with new world monkey that is seen in United uh, the America. Even very lower, uh, very less or uh, similarity with the lower primates such as uh, uh, lemurs or uh, uh, what you call in Canada one particular um, this thing Kadu Papa. Uh, you must have seen that uh, in the laboratory. We have less this one. Uh, so biochemical tests uh, support this idea. Even many times we have we say that uh, birds descendant from reptiles. Uh, how okay if you check the uh, biochemistry of birds and reptiles, you can see some sort of association uh, or some sort of relationship. So all these are the evidences uh, for us to support the entire theory of evolution or uh, we can say that the evolution is taking place and the more complex organisms have descended from the more simpler forms. This is what uh, we are trying to find out here. Even the, not only from biochemistry, even anatomy, if you look into the anatomy of the organism, there also you can see the uh, evolution uh, or uh, 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 many examples which are evidences in support of evolution. Even if you take the uh, homologous organs, what do you mean by homologous organs? Uh, homologous organs are the organs which are similar in origin and structure but different in function. Uh, for example, if you take the forelimbs uh, of mammal they are, for external appearance and functioning is different. For example, in case of the human, the uh, bones, forelimb bones are developed in such a way that uh, our entire forelimb is developed uh, to carry out so many activities with your fingers and other things. You see the structure of the human uh, forelimb. Then you know the cat, the structure, the function is different. In cat, the forelimbs are used for perching or holding or jumping, running and all those things. In human beings, we do not use forelimbs for running. Uh, then even if you see the bat, in bat, the forelimbs are modified into wing-like structure which helps in flight. Or poise, it's a uh, aquatic mammal where the forelimbs are uh, have modified into flippers which help them in swimming. Even in the uh, forelimbs of the horse, if you see, that's also that is mainly meant for running. So, functional differences are there. But anatomically, if you see that, the structurally, if you see the bones, they all of them are built on the same ground plan. All of them have built from the same ground plan. Uh, that's why we can say that there is some relationship among all these mammals, 
may be closely related, some may be uh, distantly related. That's a different issue. But in spite of all these things, you can see a lot of similarities, anatomical similarities. Functionally, it may be different. This functional development of changes that may have occurred in the forelimb as a result of evolution uh, to cater the demand of individual species, uh, these have been modified and adjusted. Uh, this, uh, these are known as homologous structure. For example, the forelimbs of human, whale, dog, birds, even birds are superficially dissimilar, yet they are made out of the same bones. See here, uh, human, horse, cat, bat, bird, and whale. They're superficially, they are totally different. But if you see internally anatomy, they are made up of same bones. They have similar arrangements. Muscles, nerves, and blood vessels, same blood vessels, same muscles. They come attached to this. And even you can see similarity uh, with respect to the arrangement of the structures also. Have similar pattern of embryonic development. So homologous structures, structures have different mature form and function in different organisms, but all of them have developed from the same embryonic tissues. They are known as homologous organs. All vertebrate limbs, see, all vertebrate uh, limbs, they have developed on a common platform. First, at the thigh region, there will be ball and socket joint. Uh, at the knee, they, you have a hinge joint. Then uh, you have the digits. It's a common one. Human arm or any animal you take. There is group of small bones there. Whereas the first, there is a single bone, two bones and five jointed digits. The forelimbs, even if you see uh, the basic pattern of the limbs and the modification, see this is in lizard, here also it's a single bone, first bone. The second bone is always split two bones, wherever you take. Then there are some small bones and groups of bones. So that is the evidences, uh, uh, what you call the homologous organs, but modified in different forms. That's a different thing. First, uh, you can see the upper arm, that the humerus. Then there are two bones, radius and ulna. Then carpels, metacarpels, and phalanges. See here. Irrespective of type of the uh, limbs in different animals. Even here also you can clearly see. So this uh, say that uh, gives us uh, some indirect evidences with respect to this evolution. Comparative morphology even if you some of the structure. Similar structure but different function. What you can call. The photograph will clearly tell you. See there are two bones always. Radius and ulna. Humerus single bone. Then radius and ulna. Then you have carpels, metacarpels, phalanges. Like homologous structure, there are analogous structures. What do I mean by analogous structure? They are similar in function, but not in structure. Though they look alike, they do not show close evolutionary connections. Uh, to give an example, the wing of a bat wing of a bird and wing of an insect. The functionally, they are similar, where the wings are used for flight. But if you look into their anatomy, they are different. See here, the birds, bat or a fly, the wings pattern. Uh, wings of insect and birds and bats, if you say, they serve the same function, but differ considerably. In birds and bats, four limbs are modified into wings. But in case of the insects, the wings are extension of the skin. Um, even in the embryonic development, 
they show differences here. Uh, both analog, they are uh, analogous organs, analogous features. So the identical function looks similar, but differs. See, did the wing of a bird, bat, did the, did the uh, wing of a bird, and did the wing of an insect? How much differ? How much they show the differences? And they, you do not see much close similarities or affinities or relationship, uh, not anatomical or embryological uh, similarities. Only superficially, morphologically or structurally, they show such similarities. Uh, the wings of all these three organisms have developed independently and different in more recent ancestors of each animal. That is what we call analogous organs. Structurally similar, but anatomically and as far as the origin is concerned, they are uh, different. Then there are many, we can also claim the evidence from anatomy. There are the anatomical evidences. Because they are the very strong evidences uh, in support of evolution. Uh, when you look into when you compare how the organisms develop uh, in the early stage, that gives us some very strong anatomical evidences. For example, any vertebrae you see, the embryo of the vertebrae possess pharyngeal pouches and develops into uh, different organs. In case of the human, it develops into guts and glands and ducts in fish into gill slits like this. So, uh, but if you look into the embryo of a fish and human, um, in both the embryo, we have pharyngeal pouches, which may develop into different organs in the adult. For example, in human, it may develop into gland and ducts, but in fish, it may develop into gill and slits, gill slits. Then, uh, Another you see the vestigial structures. What do you mean by vestigial structures or vestigial organs? The organs which were functional at one time, but now they have become atrophic or not having any function to them. Uh, to give an example, the wisdom teeth. In case of the man, human being. Wisdom teeth is the large set of teeth. Even uh, you might not have developed the wisdom teeth. Only it will be after 26, 27 years. Then only your dentition will be complete. 32 teeth will be there. Uh, this uh, wisdom teeth has no function now. Um, most of the time it creates problem. You have to go to the dentist and uh, get it removed. So they have no apparent function. But still uh, resembles the and still found because our ancestors were using that. That is the anatomical evidences, vestigial organs. For example, the vestigial organs um, structure in the whales. In case of the whales, there is no hind limb, but still then you can see the hind limb bones. In case of the whale, there is no hind limb, which all of you know, but if you see the osteology or bones of the whale, there you see a lot of uh, the uh, hind limb bones. That's the vestigial structure. Present day whales, it has no use. But what it suggests, the whales are secondarily aquatic mammals. Primarily their ancestors were the terrestrial organism. Maybe because of some reason they must have migrated from land to water. And slowly in water they have washed the for hind limb because hind limbs are of no use in the swan, but still then uh, they are represented in the form of some bones. Uh, in case of the human beings also, uh, none of us have tail. Human beings, I hope all of you agree to the fact we do not have tail. Though we may behave as if we are having tail, but we don't Physically, we don't have a tail. But if you see our uh, vertebral column, 
there are some bones the caudal bones are there they have not developed that's all they have become atrophic uh, that's the one so these are uh, some of, even in case of the human being muscles of wiggling ears can you move, move your ear pinna Many of us can't, but there are people who can move their ear pinna also. So this is a vestigial structure. Yes, of the other organisms which were uh, primitive organism, moving ear pinna in order to detect the sound wave was very very essential. But now in human beings, it's of no use. So that's why most of us cannot wiggle our ear pinna. But the few of you might have seen they can move their ear pin uh, then uh, boya constrictions in case of the rudimentary hind legs in some of the snakes hind limbs bones are there then uh, even one particular fish that is mantis there are fingernails on their fins on the fin, you have a fingernail like. Though fingernails are of no use, in the claws are of no use for a aquatic fish. And most of the cave fishes, the fishes which are living in the cave, they are blind. So these are some of the vestigial organs. Still they have eyes, non-functional eyes. So like that we can see a uh, lot of uh, such evidences. A neck vertebrae. Uh, neck vertebrae, if you see, in case of the geese, which have a long neck, they have 25 vertebrae. One of the dinosaurs, that is the Pleosaurus, was having 76 vertebrae. But in case of the human being, uh, in case of the mammals, it is 7. Giraffes are having such a long neck, in spite of that, the neck is made up of only seven vertebrae. Uh, whereas uh, the geese, comparatively, they have a short neck compared to giraffe and other things, they have 25 vertebrae. So, uh, reduction in the number of vertebrae from birds to mammal is very evident. Uh, Whatever may be the uh, length of the neck. Don't think that giraffes having long neck, they have more uh, uh, neck vertebrae and human beings are having less number of vertebrae. All mammals are having seven vertebrae. Then atavism, another characteristic feature. What is atavism? Sudden reappearance of ancestral character, lost character. A character which is not observed either in the parents or recent ancestors of the organism, uh, all of a sudden, uh, this character may appear in some or in one or two individuals. Uh, to give a very good example for this, recently I have read in a newspaper that a boy was born with a long tail. Boy was born with a tail. It's atavism. Presence of tail is certainly a characteristic feature of our ancestors. Long back, when we had an ancestor, monkey-like, monkey-like ancestor, not monkey, <coughs> they, they, are the, they were arboreal and tails were of, no, of some use. But now in human beings, we don't need any tail. But still then, uh, sudden reappearance of some lost characters, showing that we have evolved from an ancestor which was having teeth that is suggested uh, and this is very extreme rarity uh, in population i should say that uh, so this uh, atavism even uh, a very rare character and but certainly it gives us an evidence with respect to our ancestry even we have more uh,
evidence is from uh, in support of evolution. Uh, I see two things. The molluscans, they are having photoreceptors and they are also facing forward. In vertebrae, we have photoreceptors on the face, but they are back on the side. But here in um, Molluscan, the photoreceptors refers to the cells which are sensitive to light. Only they can detect whether it is a presence or absence of light. But if you come to vertebrates, uh, then these same uh, photoreceptors are modified, developed into uh, eyes, even which can uh, sense the color and all those things. So this is another uh, very good example for we have the very primitive photoreceptors have developed into uh, the modern day eyes. So this is the anatomical evidence, eyes of a vertebrate, how it is. This one. So this is the eyes of a mollusca. See, the both of them are photoreceptor cells, but here we have more developed, but here it is more primitive. Nerve fibers to the brain, here also the nerve fibers, optic nerve goes to the brain. Then another one is the embryological evidence or in the anatomy. If you look into the embryo of any organism starting from fish to human being, all of them look similar. See, the, this is the last one. The, uh, in any of these things, they have, we have a tail. We have tail snake, chicken or salamander or even in fish and all those things, all these organ embryos are having pharyngeal functions which you can clearly see even in human beings, chicken, snake. That means at the early stage of our development, we show some of the ancestral character. Embryo is the most early stage in the development of an individual and during that period, we show our ancestral character and all embryos irrespective of whether it is a human embryo or a fish embryo, they have a lot of similarities. Uh, here two are very evident, one is the presence of tail and the third one is the pharyngeal pouches. That shows that uh, descent from a common ancestor, all of them, all of us have evolved from a common ancestor, this is in support of the evolution. Uh, the, all vertebrates are similar, but fade as the development continues. See, this is the uh, in different stages. See, in the first stage, the embryos of all organisms, either it may be fish, salamander, uh, toads, chick, frog, or it may be a calf, rabbit, or a human, they are seen. But when they grow, the differences you can see. In the first row, you can see the early stage embryos, and in the last row, you can see the adult form, how different they that, but initially, all of them look similar. So, even uh, the top row view, the bottom, uh, same stages. Even <coughs> as I have told you, even the structures, we have homologous structures and analogous structures. Uh, homologous structures are basically similar structures, uh, but analogous structures where we have the similarity is unrelated, though they serve the same function. The vestigial structures, blind cave dwelling fishes still have eyes. Just to summarize what we have discussed, claws, vestigial structures are non-functional and uh, but still then we see them. Uh, why do dogs have a very tiny functionless toe. Though it's of no use, see, this is of no use to him. It is resembling the thumb of a human being or adults, a human being. Ancestral dogs have five toes, but now uh, all of them used to touch the ground, but uh, they are evolved in such a way that, that the first toe become weaker, only four toes are touching the ground. Big toe and the thumb were lost or reduced, you all know, to their present state. The rear limb of the whales 
the hind limb of the whales had tiny vestigial black limbs but present day uh, whales they do not have limbs and even they do not use limbs now the evolution evolution um, evidences of evolution in support of fossils probably above because in the evolution as far as the evidences of evolution is concerned the fossils are the direct proof and about that uh, i would like to discuss in the uh, next class because now even if i start the time may not be uh, permitting me to discuss all those things uh, so that's why uh, for the day uh, i would like to uh, wind up now uh, so in ella seriya kanustha itta heli howdu sir kelustha howdu howdu sir yes sir okay then uh, uh, for the day we will stop and in the next class we will continue huh? okay till then take care bye if you have any doubt you just ask ನಿನ್ನೆ ನಾನೊಂದು ರೈಟ್ ಅಪ್ ಕಳಿಸಿದ್ದೇನೆ ಮುಟ್ಟಿರ್ಬೇಕಲ್ಲ ನಿಮ್ಗೆ ಹಲೋ